Hey everyone, uh, welcome to my presentation today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, modern WAF bypasses uh, on, on large attack services. So I guess over the last few years, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of different companies that are moving to uh, having a lot more WAFs around, uh, around their attack surface. And often this covers their entire attack surface or a big portion of it. So today I'm going to be going through a bunch of different techniques that I've come up with and tools that I've used out there uh, that help you bypass these WAFs and hopefully uh, allow you to find those critical bugs, even if there's a WAF in place. Um, so before we get into it, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Shabam Shah. I have over 10 years of bug bounty experience. I'm the co-founder of Asset Note, which is the leading attack surface management platform in the industry. And I've also been crowned the most valuable hacker at two different HackerOne live hacking events in the past. Um, so yeah, that's basically me. I mean, I, I like to bypass WAFs and today I will be showing, showing techniques that uh, go against the typical WAF bypasses that you see in the wild, but hopefully by the end of um, this presentation, uh, everyone would have learned a few things about bypassing WAFs and how I approach this topic as well. So the first thing I want to go through is the state of modern attack surfaces and you know how WAFs find their place in modern attack surfaces as well. Um, so I've, I've noticed that um, over the last few years, uh, a lot has changed. Uh, there's been a lot more adoption of cloud software and hardware WAFs. I think around five years ago, I didn't actually see that many WAFs deployed in, at such a scale. But these days with the threats of API security, as well as you know just generally uh, defense in depth, I'm seeing more and more companies in the bug bounty space, as well as in the wild, um, adapt a lot more WAFs um, and yeah, as it becomes more and more prevalent, um, especially in cloud platforms, um, things like Akamai and, and, and whatever else, they're all, all, all the Amazon WAFs, they're all really readily available now. And um, I think that uh, this is gonna be a growing pain for us in the bug bounty community over the next few years, making sure that we are able to bypass the WAFs and find the vulnerabilities that are living there, even though the WAFs exist. So I think, you know, something I've noticed as well um, is I've noticed some more and more bug bounties where you know there's like over twenty thousand assets or something, but still, <laughs> almost all of them are covered with the Akamai with an Akamai WAF, for example. Um, but we need to be able to adapt to this. Uh, we need to be able to learn how to deal with this and find vulnerabilities, even though these these WAFs are in place. And this goes for um, pretty much everything in in the bug bounty space. Everything is changing so frequently that we do need to make sure that we keep up with it and we have our techniques and tools of the trade um, to still be able to find the critical vulnerabilities we need to. So, you know, you might have come across an attack surface and at first glance, this might look extremely discouraging because you see you know, thousands of assets going to Akamai and you're like, God damn, this is not going to be enjoyable for me because I won't be able to do easy brute forcing. I won't be able to understand what's living on these assets. I won't be able to find the vulnerabilities easily or do my reconnaissance side easily due to the, the large prevalence of WAFs on an attack surface. But I think that this whole presentation, and I hope that this is what everyone takes away from this presentation is, you know, don't be discouraged by this. There are many ways around this and we'll go through all of them uh, step by step. So yeah, don't be discouraged. It's our job to find a way through. Um, if you come across this sort of attack surface, just remember that WAFs are just a nuisance. They're not gonna prevent us from getting what we really want if we really want it. And uh, yeah, this presentation will go through several tools, techniques, and I guess tips and tricks that I use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to bypass these sort of attack surfaces, uh, WAFs that are in place. Um, before we go into uh, these tools and tricks and whatever else, I do want to quickly talk about my philosophy when bypassing WAFs. And you know something that, that honestly confuses me in the um, technical scenes of bug bounties or whatever else is sometimes people go through a really insane effort um, to bypass a WAF. And that might be through uh, you know coming up with a really complex payload that the WAF doesn't recognize. Now, don't get me wrong, I completely respect these payloads that people are meticulously crafting, but I think that most WAFs these days do not need that much effort to bypass and also, I, I like to keep my WAF bypasses as simple as possible. I think that simple bypasses are the best bypasses. So this presentation will focus on the easy ways to bypass WAFs that I know of. Um, and also, you know, probably some techniques that you may not even have known um, before this presentation. And that's what I'm hoping that you get to know after this presentation. 
Um, what this presentation doesn't cover is it doesn't cover any single alteration or mutation of a pre-existing payload that you know that we see around on Twitter. It does not cover any um, mutation of inputs to beat WAFs. It doesn't cover anything like that. It just covers a mindset and a methodology of bypassing WAFs without touching your payloads. And yeah, really, uh, you know, there are also other techniques that I'm not going to cover that are already well known and discussed uh, in the past such as finding the origin IP and hitting it directly, or things like vhost hopping once you have an origin IP in general, or another um, IP on the attack surface. So this uh, entire presentation is gonna go through things that hopefully are a bit novel to you and you find some value in and can start using literally after this presentation in your WAF bypass journey as well. Um, the Biggest thing that I hope um, I'll go through today is uh, just a common flaw that almost all WAFs have, which is request size limits. Now, it's not a new concept, um, but I don't think it's discussed enough. And I think that uh, we really need to go through this so that people have an understanding that you don't need to, especially if it's uh, any request which has a body, like a post, put, or patch, um, you know, WAFs can only inspect a certain amount of the body content. So you don't need to go through that insane effort to mutate a SQL injection payload or something like that or an XSS if it is inside a request body in order to bypass the WAF. Now this is um, kind of logical. Um, it's mainly due to performance issues. I mean, uh, WAFs have to process an insane amount of data all the time and they also are expected to not take forever. They're supposed to respond in a pretty timely manner. So it is, it is understandable that these engineers that have built these WAFs um, have realized that, oh, oh crap, we can only process a certain amount of the request body before we have to return the response to the user. Otherwise, the uh, performance and the usability of WAFs would really uh, hinder um, you know, the user experience, basically. Um, so yeah, most, most WAFs have a default configurable max body size to inspect. Um, some WAFs have different behaviors around what they're going to do if that, that uh, max body size is hit, but that's usually configurable WAF by WAF. But what you'll typically find in the wild is that a lot of WAFs, um, after you send a certain uh, size request body, uh, it will ignore everything after that uh, size of the request body. It's essentially a very effective WAF bypass, but just remember this only works for post, put, patch requests, anything's with, anything with a request body. So it can't be within get parameters. It can't be, in some cases, it can't be within headers. Um, it typically has to be inside a request body. Um, I have linked these three different references to this. This is not a new technique, as I said. Um, it's something that's just not well discussed and not well known in the bug bounty space that you know, hopefully after this presentation, you can take it away from here. Um, so we can go through, you know, the, the, the first WAF, which is AWS, probably a, a pretty popular WAF these days. And really the documentation um, is quite clear. Uh, the maximum size of a request body that I can inspect is around 8 KB for an application load balancer and app sync. Um, but it can go up to 64 KB for CloudFront, API Gateway, Cognito, App Runner. Uh, and, and, and verified access protections. But, you know, in, 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 in the grand scheme of things, 8 KB or 64 KB is not that large. And um, in most cases, what you'll find is it is possible to just sneak your payload in after the 8 KB or after the 64 KB um, and not actually be blocked by the WAF in any way or form. So this is, um, again, a common limitation of WAFs that we'll go through and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss a bit further as well about this. We look at Azure as well. Um, so Azure does have uh, a lot of different configurations for this, but um, pretty much anything larger than 128 KB, uh, there's two options. Either you can go into prevention mode, which means that it will log and block the requests, or it will uh, go into detection mode, which will detect that there's a larger content length, but it will um, ignore the rest from a WAF protection perspective, and it will um, basically just log that request. Um, so these two different conf configurations will depend on the environment, but in many cases what I've seen is even with the Azure WAF, after sending 128 KB of data, uh, you can just sneak your payloads in directly after that. 
Um, and of course, uh, my biggest nemesis, and I think a lot of hackers' biggest nemesis, Akamai WAF, which is probably one of the ones that I see most popularly on enterprise attack surfaces. Um, it only really inspects the first eight kilobytes of the request. You can increase this uh, maximum to 128 KB, um, but honestly, it's um, what I've seen in the wild is no one really does that. Eight KB is usually enough to bypass Akamai. And like, who else hates the Akamai Access Denied page? Because I hate this page. I definitely do not like seeing it. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you also get to see it a lot less in your lifetime. Um, Cloudflare is interesting. So they, they also only really inspect the first 128 KB of a request. But I have seen that they do have enterprise plans that do allow for a much larger inspection. Uh, I think up to 500 megabytes, but um, really uh, 128 KB, pretty similar to all the other WAFs, um, and you can just bypass it after the 128 KB of junk data. So yeah, and I guess you know other WAFs, they you know similarly have uh, the same design flaw. Uh, I think almost any WAF you you look at will decide to basically only process a certain amount of data inside the request body and anything after that it will either uh, depending on the configuration discard the request or let you send the request but at the same time maybe log it or something like that so i think you know one of the things to quickly discuss here is you know like what is the mitigation here well i think i do think that it's on the waf vendors to make it easier for application owners to block requests over these sizes. But at the same time, in many cases, a lot of applications do require large request bodies, whether it's uploads or other situations where you do need a, a relatively large request body. So it is a tricky situation. It is up to the application owner to really understand, um, you know, when, when should I be blocking requests outright when they're over a certain size? And the unfortunate reality is due to the scale of a lot of these organizations and how many WAFs they have in place, to meticulously configure this across an entire attack surface is um, very, very difficult. And it's something that I don't think most organizations are doing when they're deploying WAFs. I also think that most organizations probably aren't doing um, really coherent WAF testing once the WAFs are deployed. Um, but honestly, this is a very um, common misconfiguration where you know they uh, either misconfiguration or you can put it on the WAF itself for only allowing them to process a certain amount of data. Um, but this is very, very common, and you will see it across almost every WAF uh, that you test over time. So that brings me to the next thing. Um, I do want to release a very, very simple BERT plugin that hopefully helps you with bypassing WAFs and takes away that Akamai access denied page away from you, so you never have to see that again, hopefully. Um, but it's just called No WAF Please, and it is a very simple BERT plugin that hopefully makes your life a little bit easier. I've been using it quite a bit when testing on Akamai targets, um, and we'll just go through it really quickly. So what this plugin does is it helps pad out requests so that WAFs can be bypassed. Um, it will automatically detect the context. So for example, if I'm looking at a, uh, a request which is XML, it will automatically pad out the XML with an XML comment. If it is JSON, it will automatically pad out the JSON with a, uh, a, a fake key and fake value. And if it's URL encoded, it will do the same thing, but just in the URL encoded format. So it's basically just a very simple context aware tool that you can just access via Burp's repeater tab, and it will automatically pad out the request for you in the location that you click inside that repeater tab. So if we take a quick look at what that, that will be, um, I've got a little bit of a demo here. Um, and hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so we've got a request here that's uh, going to techdocs.akamai.com and it has a SQL injection payload inside an XML um, body. You can see that this um, payload is going to fail because it doesn't really have any WAF bypass. Um, so we've got the access denied from Akamai, which we don't like seeing. We go into here, we look at extensions and no WAF please, and then insert eight kilobytes of data. And it will automatically insert a XML comment, which is of eight kilobytes of length. And we send the request again. And suddenly, um, drum roll, uh, we don't actually have the Akamai access denied page anymore. We're now getting a 404 found, not found, which means that the request is going through and Akamai is no longer blocking us. I think that, um, 
this is a very universal bypass for Akamai and other WAFs. And, you know, I hope that um, at least from this presentation, you take this away as please don't spend like 50 gazillion hours coming up with a very complex WAF bypass payload when it's something like a request body and you're on something like Akamai. There are many easier ways to bypass these WAFs and this is just one of them, um, but we will go through some other examples as well in this uh, presentation. So anyways, you can get this tool. Um, it's located on GitHub uh, on the asset note uh, GitHub as no WAF please. And I just wanted to um, summarize what I've gone through over the last few slides. Um, the WAF limitations uh, table is also inside the repo. Um, I have gone through and documented every WAF provider and what the maximum request body size limit is. So when you use this tool, um, you can just pad out your requests as per this table, and hopefully you'll be able to bypass these WAFs in no time. Um, the next, the next uh, thing I want to go through is, you know, how, how do you actually fuzz a host behind Akamai or, or any WAF really? And, you know, I mean, there's many ways to, to, to kind of do this and many ways to skin a cat, but um, we will go through uh, the methods that I use on a day-to-day -day basis um, and what has worked exceptionally well for me as well. When I talk about fuzzing, I'm talking about like, you know, for example, directory and file brute forcing. I'm talking about uh, going through a very large list of hosts and looking for a specific path and specific contents, and that sort of thing. So um, before we go into the uh, more custom solutions, let's just quickly go, uh, go through something that's just available straight out of the box on Burp Suite. If you install the IP Rotate um, plugin and you provide your access keys for AWS, it can be a dummy account or something like that, um, it will spin up a bunch of API gateways uh, on a number of different regions that you select and then it will route all traffic through these API gateways. So it can be quite um, useful when you're doing things like uh, using the intruder or you're just trying to make sure that every request you make through Burp is, not, um, is, is going through a different IP address. Um, this is something that I still recommend that you um, uh, limit the amount of threads that you use because you still can see some rate limiting if you are going at a really high thread rate. However, yeah, this is a really neat solution. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. You just need an AWS account and you need this IP rotate plugin from Portswigger or on the Portswigger uh, GitHub and um, you'll be able to bypass WAFs in no time. Um, just to quickly explain how this works for the people that may not understand how API gateways can lead to a WAF bypass. Um, the architecture of API gateways on AWS is that essentially you have um, an API gateway and each request you make to the API gateway, it's actually using a different IP address um, every time when it reaches out to the internet when it makes outbound requests. Um, this is an architectural decision that AWS has made. And I think for us hackers, it is a really good um, really good outcome for us when it comes to WAF bypasses because we do want a unique set of IPs every time we're requesting and who better than AWS to give us unique sets of IPs. Um, they do own so many IP ranges in the world so they are one of the best people to to use um, when it comes to a big IP pool. Now um, this theme of using API gateways to bypass WAFs it is going to um, it is going to show up again when we discuss Fireprox, um, but those are the only two uh, tools that use API gateways in this in this presentation. Anyways, IP Rotate is a great option if you're just sticking to Burp, but let's say that you're going after an individual target. Um, if you want to go after an individual target, what I recommend using is something called Fireprox. Um, what it will do is it will take in a URL and it will generate a API gateway URL for you that you can use to do all of your fuzzing. So um, in this case, um, I'm providing an example, api.example.com is a URL and it generates a, a new API gateway URL that you can now use with all of your existing tools to do your brute forcing and any of your testing uh, that you want to do. Um, this is quite great because it's tool agnostic and you don't need something like Burp Suite or you don't need to set up anything super complex. Um, and you can just basically throw it into any tool and see how you go there. Now, what I will state is because IP Rotate is uh, multiple regions, you do have a bigger pool of IP addresses. In this technique, you do have to be mindful of how many threads you use because you can still get rate limited even though you have a fairly unique set of IPs. Um, but anyways, I do recommend Fireprox. I use it quite a lot, um, even today. Um, so yeah, it's quite, quite good. 
And then um, probably one of my favorites these days as well is Shadow Clone. You might have heard this um, spoken about on the Critical Thinking podcast. Um, you might have seen this tool uh, on GitHub, but you may not really know how to use it. And that's why today I'm going to go through some of the use cases with Shadow Clone and how I use it on a day to day basis. But essentially, what Shadow Clone does is that it will take the list of hosts that you have, or it will take your word list, and it will run it across, run it across a fleet of serverless compute. Um, it's compatible with any cloud provider, but at the moment, AWS is probably the most well-documented, and it has really good IP variability to bypass WAFs. Um, so you can provide it a really large list of hosts, or you can even target an individual WAF um, blocked site with a large word list, and you can obtain the results in minutes. Now, this is a really big innovation um, because I think one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize is um, in the past, when it came to brute forcing, uh, like for example, content discovery on a host with Akamai, that was a relatively expensive task to do. Either you spun up a really large fleet of servers, or you bought uh, some sort of unlimited proxy system that you could use for every single request. And, and both of those are bound by different limitations. The proxy systems specifically with bandwidth, as well as how much data you're sending. Um, so this was a, a cost prohibitive exercise in the past. Now, the great thing about Shadow Clone is that it is using um, AWS serverless or uh, any of these cloud platform serverless, which allow for up to 1 million invocations for free for Azure and AWS and 2 million for GCP, um, which honestly is fantastic. I think that you won't actually spend too much money when using Shadow Clone. Um, from my experience, I haven't spent a crazy amount uh, with Shadow Clone and I am getting the speed and the results that I'm looking for when it comes to bypassing an attack surface with large, uh, large presence of WAFs. So we'll go through quickly what this looks like in practice. Um, now, this presentation is not going to go through how to set it up. Um, there is a wiki on Shadow Clones GitHub which explains how to set it up. It is fairly straightforward. It might take you an hour or two initially to set it up, but I think it will pay dividends for weeks, months, or years. So I do think that you should set it up and it should be a part of your arsenal and your tool belt. Um, it is something that you should reach to when you need to do mass exploitation or mass uh, discovery on WAF protected uh, hosts. So the first part of the workflow that we're gonna go through is um, just basically obtaining the live uh, hosts via HTTPX. Now this is important because we need to obtain this list first before we um, use it in all future shadow clone commands. And um, basically, you just run this very simple command. You provide your assets, um, new line delimited. You provide a split uh, parameter, which tells um, shadow clone how many um, assets should each task do. And in this case, I've said each task, each uh, serverless worker should do 40 assets. And then everything should be combined and output into a file called all-assets-online. Um, and this is the final command that I would use. And, it, and finally, once it's finished, um, this file, all-assets-online, would contain all of the online assets as per HTTPX. And what would have happened in the background is we would have seen you know, X number of serverless workers that spun up and simultaneously processed uh, the list of assets 40 at a time per each worker. And at the end, all of that data gets combined back together and put into a file called all assets online. Um, but anyways, this is um, the first part of the workflow. So once you've obtained the um, live hosts with HTTPX, you wanna move on to the next thing, which is maybe something a bit more interesting. Um, also, before we get there, um, there is a temporary execution log that you can grep just to make sure that everything is working correctly. This can be quite useful and you can cancel your executions if you see something that's incorrect, like a some sort of error or something like that. So over here I've highlighted, there is an execution log that um, is sitting in the temp directory. You can just cat that and see if everything's working okay. So we move on to the second part of the workflow, um, which is checking a list of online assets for a specific vulnerability via HTTPX. Now, often if you were to do something like this and it's a very large list of um, uh, assets or a very large attack surface that's protected by a WAF, you're gonna be blocked fairly quickly. You might even get Akamai banned, which everyone knows is a, 
is a huge pain and I'm pretty sure that your relatives get quite angry as well when they can't access their favorite airline. So we're trying to avoid that and we're, you know, we're trying to scan a very large attack surface for a specific um, specific uh, attack vector and seeing whether or not there's any anything there. So in this case, we take our list of online assets from the previous step and then we do another HTTPX command, but we provide a path and we provide a match string, which in this case is root x00. So in this case, we're looking for a path traversal vulnerability across all of the online assets that we had from the first step. And we are matching on a specific thing in the response that will confirm the presence of that vulnerability. Now, this is um, a very simple check that you can do across a large list of assets, but we can go into more complex ones in just a second. So in this example, I ran this across my really large list of online assets. I found an asset that was vulnerable. And then, yeah, I was able to do path traversal and read arbitrary files from the local system as demonstrated in this burp request. But yeah, once you finish this command, matched vuns will have a list of all the combined results. So that's uh, a pretty simple um, workflow. And then we'll go on to uh, something a bit more interesting. Um, but before we get there, yeah, you can do this for any zero days or creative research ideas or theories you may have. And yeah, you, you will find sometimes that um, some of your wildest theories should always be tested across some of the largest attack surfaces that you have or a really large list of assets because you'll be surprised at what works um, when, when you run it across such a large list of assets and you'd be surprised at what comes out of that basically. I think often you can prove these theories quite quite easily with tools like Shadow Clone these days. Um, and you know, from my experience, I haven't actually had a super high bill with Shadow Clone. The most I've had is like 100 USD in a month. And that's with really extensive usage as well. Um, do be mindful. I do recommend that if you do use something like Shadow Clone, you do set up billing alerts on your cloud provider um, so that you understand if you go over any of the thresholds that you're not looking to go over. Um, but anyways, this is a, a very effective method. We'll move on to something a bit more interesting. Um, let's say that you wanted to find all of the Swagger um, files across a really large attack surface or whatever it may be, or a WAF protected attack surface. Um, what you can use here is um, uh, basically what we're doing is we're grabbing a nuclei template um, from you know uh, a GitHub gist, we're saving it to a uh, location, and then we're running nuclei over uh, this large attack surface with that Swagger um, template. Now you will notice a few things here. The split value is a lot less. It's only five and you will notice that we've added timeouts and some guardrails to nuclei to make sure that it doesn't spin its wheels. Um, now in this case, it, this is also fantastic because nuclei templates can be much more complex than a simple HTTPX command that just matches on a string at a specific path. Uh, for example. So you can use this to, I guess, spread out a lot of your, your scanning across the large attack services. Um, and this is something that's quite effective. Now, I absolutely would not recommend running a large list of nuclei templates across uh, a, a, an attack surface. Um, Shadow Clone is really meant for this use case of running a singular thing on a sing uh, across an attack surface. So one template across an entire attack surface, splitting the assets by five per Per, per file. Um, so this is an example and you can see that we, um, we we found a few Swagger UIs on the attack surface that we were looking for. Now again, this is quite useful um, on attack surfaces with WAFs because you will find that if you are spamming a attack surface with a WAF, which, with WAFs across the attack surface, it will lead to you being um, rate limited or blocked in some way. Um, so this is something that you can use as you can remember each of these uh, serverless workers have their own unique IP addresses when they're spun up. And um, probably one of the, the, the best workflows that I love about Shadow Clone is being able to uh, really, really quickly uh, fuzz a target for, um, for, for with FFUF and find all the files and directories. Um, and in this case, um, this is incredibly valuable when it's protected by a WAF because I think anyone that's tried to um, do directory and file brute forcing on a WAF would realize that um, you know almost immediately you get rate limited or blocked by the WAF. So in this case, um, you know I've split up my word list by 300. Obviously, you probably want to use a smaller word list. You probably want to split it a bit less than 300, um, but this is just to prove the concept. And you can see that inside my Nginx access log, um, each IP for each request is unique. 
um, and you know um, at the end of the execution you can see that it's returned a list of files and folders that it's found on this host um, so this is just uh, another really great workflow with shadow clone that i highly recommend Um, now that we've gone through um, some of the tools, techniques, and Shadow Clone and all that stuff, I want to talk a little bit more about alternative WAF bypass techniques. And maybe some you know, maybe some you don't know, but there's two in particular that I want to discuss. Remember, the, the goal of this presentation is not to discuss mutating your payloads or coming up with some really complex um, you know, WAF bypass technique. It's to talk about the easy things, the things that you can uh, accomplish and achieve right after this presentation, and hopefully something that you can take away from this presentation forever. So one of my favorite techniques is um, bypassing the WAF via the WAF. Um, so this is a, a really cool technique that was published um, some time ago, but some WAFs will allow you to protect the origin by only accepting uh, authenticated TLS pools. What that means is you get a certificate from the WAF that says, okay, you can now put this in your reverse proxy to say that you'll only accept requests that are signed uh, and recognized by this certificate. Um, so what will happen is, is um, if that certificate is shared, for example, in the case of Cloudflare, they had a, a shared certificate for a very long time, and you know the origin IP of the asset. Well, you can then just sign up to the WAF, set up the DNS record to the origin IP, make it proxy through the WAF, and then reduce all the WAF settings to the absolute lowest so you can do all of your um, payloads on that, uh, on that host, on that origin IP, while still going through the uh, WAF provider. So there was this excellent blog post um, on certitude.consulting using Cloudflare to bypass Cloudflare. And um, you know this is also effective when they've um, basically whitelisted a, a WAF's IP ranges. Um, and the same, same sort of idea as authenticated TLS pools, um, you can bypass the WAF by just adding that IP address, the origin IP address to your own setup of the WAF, proxying it through the WAF, and then suddenly you can then um, you know, bypass that WAF as well because it's coming from known IP addresses. Now, Cloudflare did acknowledge this issue and they did uh, rate it as high. Eventually, um, initially they they weren't um, they weren't going to do too much about it, but they are now encouraging most customers to use a per zone uh, TLS certificate uh, per zone certificate for authenticated TLS pools. Um, now, this is. This is pretty slow adoption. Uh, I still think that this is possible in many cases, as long as you can understand what the origin IP ad address is. So I hope this is a, a cool little technique that you may not have known about um, before this presentation. Um, and lastly, uh, I just want to quickly talk about um, bypassing WAFs through H2C smuggling. Now, this is unlikely to be the case when it's a popular provider like Akamai or Cloudflare, um, but this is likely to be the case if it is a you know AWS ALB or if it is a um, reverse proxy with a WAF system installed in it uh, or some sort of internal um, you know internal WAF infrastructure. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're able to perform a HUC smuggling attack on your target, you may be able to bypass the restrictions of the WAF and any sort of rate limiting as well. Now, HUC smuggling has been a pretty well known and documented technique, but it doesn't get much attention from a WAF bypass perspective. Um, I have provided a link here that you can read a little bit more about H2C smuggling. There are many tools out there that let you do H2C smuggling, as well as test whether or not um, you know a, a, an asset is vulnerable to H2C smuggling. So I will probably put this at the, the bottom of my tool list when it comes to bypassing WAFs. If I'm absolutely desperate, I usually go this route. I've only had success a few times, to be frank and honest, um, but this is a valid WAF bypass technique that doesn't get as much light from the community. Anyways, that's all guys. I, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I know I've ran through a lot of things very quickly. I appreciate you tuning in and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Thanks everyone. Bye.